Imagine if someone asks you, you know how we just got hundreds of pounds of metal to float through the sky? Well, why don't we have it land on water too? And if your name was Henri Fabre in the year 1910, you might have been crazy enough to answer, hell yes. And hence was born the seaplane. Seaplanes are very commonly used today, and that's not just as a part of a backdrop to every scenic waterfront. Now, since they can land essentially anywhere there is water, they're widely used to access remote locations without airports and have been instrumental in performing search and rescue missions over water. But there really is a lot more than meets the eye to seaplanes. They're not just planes on a boat. There's a lot of ingenious designs and water aerodynamics that goes into how they work. And so today we're going to be taking a headfirst deep dive into the world of planes on water. How exactly do seaplanes work? Let's get started. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. If you're looking for a fun and interactive way to brush up on your math and science skills, check out the link in the description. First, let's talk about what exactly is a seaplane. And to do that, we need to take a quick stroll through its family tree. Seaplanes refer to planes that can take off and land on water. And there are two broad categories. Float planes are probably what you're picturing, where the aircraft is supported by usually two floats, which create the buoyancy required to keep the aircraft above water. And oftentimes, we use the terms float plane and seaplane interchangeably. Now, float planes can be further separated into amphibious float planes or straight floats. Now, as you might be able to tell from the name, amphibious float planes can land on both water and land, usually through retractable landing gears that extend downwards from its floats. On the other hand, straight float planes will only work on water. And oftentimes, they're built by simply retrofitting floats onto the bottom of normal land-based airplanes, with some minor modifications. But there is also the slightly bizarre-looking sibling of the float plane, and that is the flying boat. And I know, this looks less like a perfectly functional plane and more resembles the first scene of the miracle on the Atlantic. But the concept behind flying boats is actually pretty simple. The underbelly of the fuselage itself creates enough buoyancy for the aircraft to float, basically acting like the hull of this plane ship. And flying boats is typically the design used for larger seaplanes. Now, if you're wondering, no, most flying boats unfortunately can't land on land. They can only water on water. Flying boats came into popularity around World War I, and for a while, they were some of the largest aircraft in the world. They weren't limited to expensive airstrips and even had extendable range by landing in the ocean next to ships or submarines carrying additional fuel. So it's for these reasons that flying boats served as bomber aircraft and transport aircraft throughout World War I and II. And at some point, flying boats even shot down some fighter aircraft. And during peaceful eras, flying boats were typically used to transport mail and passengers. I mean, just imagine, we could have been flying boating 737s out of LAX's Terminal C. But that is unfortunately not the reality today, since at the end of World War II, there became a large increase in the number of runways around the world. So it became hard for these flying boats to have an advantage. And combine that with the fact that they typically traded aerodynamics and speed for the ability to operate on water, they just couldn't really compete with the much more efficient civilian jets. Hence, that is the reason why, unfortunately, we don't see a ton of flying boats around, whereas float planes are still pretty commonly used for small-scale passenger transport today. So now that we know a little bit more about the history behind seaplanes, what makes them so special anyway? I mean, besides the fact that they're planes on water. 
a large portion of the ingenuity behind seaplanes is quite literally understated, as in it's at the bottom of the floats. Floats are what enables the aircraft to, well, float by displacing a volume of water that weighs more than the aircraft itself. And in most cases, these floats are required to be able to keep afloat almost twice the weight of a fully loaded aircraft. The shape of the bottom of the floats can actually affect the handling characteristics of the entire plane in different climates. For example, take a shallow V-bottom float. Their flat shape makes them incredibly efficient for taking off in smooth waters, but it would have a hard time in any other condition. On the other hand, a deep V-bottom float would perform pretty well in rough waters, but struggle to gain speed quickly in calm conditions. As a result, most float bottoms make a trade-off between these two extremes to optimize performance in most conditions. For example, they might use a design such as a scalloped bottom. And there is still one more thing that's special about the way these floats are designed. At first glance, it might look as if the bottom of these floats have one straight line from bow to stern. But in fact, there's usually several flat surfaces called steps, which break up the bottom of the floats. And the same design applies to both float planes and flying boats, where these steps can be found at the bottom of the fuselage itself. And to understand why we need these notches, let's take a look at how seaplanes take off. During takeoff, as seaplanes start to accelerate in the water, it'll start to hydroplane, where the bottom of the float is resting just above the surface of the water. Now, this stage is also known as running on the step. And unlike when we're driving, this is actually what we want to happen. Because as opposed to having the entire float make contact with the water during takeoff, the latter half will actually have an indent so it's sitting slightly above the surface. Now this allows some air to get underneath the float to start generating lift and reducing the resistance that the water is causing. And in this chart comparing the drag created from water during takeoff, you can see how much of a difference having the step makes, and in turn, the reduction of thrust that's required from the engines for takeoff. Hence, it's with these seemingly small design changes that actually make the entire plane so much more efficient. So now that we've gone over a bit of the designs behind seaplanes, how do they actually differ from land planes in terms of how they fly? Well, in the air, there actually isn't much of a difference, except for the added surface area and weight of the floats, which creates some additional drag. That in turn reduces the speed and the range of the seaplane. And during landings, the floats can also act as shock absorbers, which are typically the role of oiled cylinders or springs on regular aircraft. And another place where seaplanes have less complex components is they're usually not equipped with any brakes at all. And that's not just because seaplane pilots take the motto of can't stop, won't stop a little too seriously, but rather during landing, the drag of the water alone is enough to slow the plane down. And in fact, water is so effective that the landing distance for a lot of seaplanes is only around half of the distance required for takeoff. Now that's pretty impressive given that a lot of land-based planes have a longer landing distance than takeoff distance. But the fact that seaplanes don't have any brakes at all also introduces some minor inconveniences. For example, the fact that pilots can't just approach the dock straight on, as they would for a regular gait. Instead, they need to approach the dock parallel to its edge. Oftentimes, to be extra safe, they'll need to get close to the ports, shut off the engines, then manually row themselves the rest of the way. And another byproduct of the lack of brakes is that once their engines are turned on, seaplanes are essentially always in motion. There is no such thing as standing still. So for this reason, the checklist for starting a seaplane looks a little bit different. That is, pilots will complete as much as they can, including physically pushing the seaplane off the dock before starting the engines. And at that point, they better have everything they need. 
And while on the water, the rudder and ailerons can actually act as mini sails that help maneuver the aircraft. Most also have water rudders that work in the same way they do on boats. So generally, in the water, seaplanes are about as maneuverable as boats are. That is to say, they are not very maneuverable. So now that we've talked all about the cool capabilities of seaplanes, what are some of their limitations? Well, most notably, seaplanes are pretty much limited to operation in pretty smooth water only, since larger waves can create too much drag and instability for the plane to take off and land. On the other end of the spectrum, you may assume that when the water is perfectly still and, well, very scenic, that it makes for a great environment for the seaplane. But on the contrary, glassy waters actually makes for one of the most dangerous landing conditions. And that's because if you're landing on glassy water, it can be very difficult to judge your height above the surface. And also the reference point on the water that pilots typically pick out to help them navigate to land becomes impossible to distinguish. And extremely calm water also makes it difficult to take off as well, since typically waves will introduce some air bubbles underneath the floats to help reduce drag. But with glassy water, the float is in contact with the water at all times. Hence, in these scenarios, pilots will typically choose to circle around the area just prior to taking off to create some small waves. So for these reasons, seaplanes are generally limited to operation in relatively smooth weather and water conditions. So guys, if at this point you're thinking, man, I wish she talked a little bit deeper about the math and physics behind how all of this works, well, I highly recommend you head on over to Brilliant. It's an interactive learning platform for topics in math, science, and engineering. And if planes is your jam, I'd highly recommend their classical mechanics course, whether you're an absolute beginner or a seasoned scientist. I'm still learning so much and realizing just how much I've forgotten from school. But more importantly, these lessons feel like I'm playing a game and not doing work, while learning physics is just another plus. They have super interesting examples of how concepts actually apply in real life, and quizzes to bring out your inner perfectionist as well. To learn more about Brilliance, go to brilliant.org forward slash Jenny Ma and you can try it out completely free. And if you like what you see, they're kindly offering a 20% discount off their annual plan for our viewers as well. So guys, that was a little deep dive into the world of seaplanes and how they work. I initially got the idea for this video as I was taking a walk in Vancouver and noticed that every few minutes or so there would be a seaplane landing or taking off. And I realized just how nonchalant we were about this whole thing that planes can work on water. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. So I hope you guys enjoy this video. I'll be back with a lot more content just like this, so make sure you're subscribed for that. And if you enjoy this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up and let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. But that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Draft during World 1s and 2. 1s and bomber aircraft during World 1 and 2. And at some points it even shot down some fighter jets. Probably not jets, actually. Fighter planes. Flying boats became popular as pop... Mm. And at some point, flying boats even shot down some fly... Uh, hmm. Flying boats shot down fighter aircraft. These planes actually work... <laughs>